Hello and welcome to my review of Harley Merlin and the Secret Coven. Sorry about the clickbaity thumbnail, the answer to the question is at the end. But naturally I hope you'll stick around and watch my review rather than just skip through to that bit. So Harley Merlin and the Secret Coven was published in 2018 and is the first entry in a series that is now into double figures. Wow! Ten books in a year. Well I'm sure that won't have any bearing on the quality. So, Harley Mellon is just the fourth or the fifth hundredth young adult series to claim the title of the next Harry Potter. And I'm pretty sure that the title here was claimed rather than bestowed because there are virtually no similarities here that I can see. The plot follows Harley, an orphan, raised mostly by neglecting or abusive foster parents, who finds a group of friends in a school for people with magical abilities. There she finds friendly paternal figures in the school's leader and a beast-like employee. Luckily, Forrest can't get sued for plagiarism because she doesn't just steal from Harry Potter. She also borrows memory flashing from Men in Black, the containment system from Ghostbusters, an unlikable female lead from Twilight, and the world's least developed love triangle from, well, pretty much anywhere, but here, worse than any of them. So, Forrest's scene building is awry right from the very start, and it's a pattern that's repeated in more or less every scene of the book. First, there is the inherent contradiction of Harley disapproving of exploiting people with a gambling problem while working for a casino that's exploiting people with a gambling problem. In truth, the casino plays such a small part going forward that if Forrest had wanted, for example, to moralise on the perils of gambling, um, she could have had Harley outside the casino handing out leaflets on that matter. But Forrest is in such a rush to get that week's book out, that she doesn't stop to think about things, about any things. Instead, Harley is inside helping the exploitative corporate monster by catching cheaters. Then we see the first in a long line of scenes, hint, it's all of them, that is fluffed by Forrest's inability to simply maintain focus. Harley is playing a game of cards, and between deals, Forrest wedges in a page worth of exposition about Harley's status as an orphan. It's a very awkward transition. The name's Bond. James Bond. Who's the Russian lady? The one with the funny name. Yeah, I mention, I'm an orphan. After catching a cheater while he's attempting to flee, Harley is then asked questions that she offers some pretty stupid answers to, and this whole part of the scene is actually unnecessary anyway. First, before the crooked dealer attempted to run, Harley used telekinesis to throw his cards up in an attempt to distract him. She explains this by saying that she rigged the drawers with a mechanical device. Clearly dubious, the investigator could merely look in the drawer to see that that was false, so it's a bad lie and it's an unnecessary one. Because most people seeing a dealer fleeing and cards flying would assume that he threw them in the air to make some sort of distraction. Then she uses the same ability to move a chair to trip a guy. Again, the witness is unsure of what he's just seen, but Forrest is unable to explain it away, and with neither author or character offering a good explanation, Harley simply says, it's not my fault the guy has two left feet. And again, checking the CCTV would confirm the guy's suspicions right away. If we are to believe he is suspicious, as Forrest is hoping we will, then him checking neither makes it all rather unconvincing. As does Harley throwing the chair at the dealer anyway, because she's using her telekinesis uh, to throw an inanimate object at a moving target, because she finds that easier than simply giving a nudge to the moving target that would set him off balance and make him trip anyway. But in truth, that is the least of the scene's problems. The unfocused format of awful dialogue, of strange, unnecessary questions answered unconvincingly, all by lengthy passages of misplaced or outright awful exposition, is a pattern that will define virtually every scene going forward. The monster that appears at the end of the scene is huge, at least eight foot tall, with bulging pitch black eyes and two long, twisted horns that sprouted from either side of a crooked asymmetrical head. But this is the monster that was slipping in and out of air conditioning vents earlier. How did it fit? Some of these are pretty small things, but it's all in the book's first 20 pages, so it adds up very rapidly, and it doesn't make a very good first impression. And this last example is actually indicative of another forest trope, simply not thinking about the consequences of what you write. The beast's tail sneaking through the vent is a visual she wants, as is the giant beast then threatening Harley, but the two can't be one and the same. What you require is consistency and thought. Forrest offers neither at any point, and she thinks she'll get away with it because she has zero respect for her audience. 
After a bit of a scuffle, the monster is slowly getting back up on its hind legs when Harley and her would-be rescuer Wade Crowley decide it's time for a bit of a chat. Use your pause button because this is truly awful. There's some seriously bad, seriously lengthy exposition wedged into the scene where it should be at its most frantic. After presumably stopping for a cup of tea, the monster does eventually attack and is captured in a way that is in no way stolen from Ghostbusters. And the scene ends with just four or five pages more of stilted dialogue and exposition. Harley sure is lucky to bump into a character like Wade, who seems to be some kind of talking encyclopedia, willing and happy to pontificate on all sorts of subjects. It is unusual for this to happen in a public space. He tells us without any of his prompting or need. But gargoyles aren't usually so brazen. Witches and warlocks are real, handy, or it wouldn't be much of a book. But don't call them wizards, though. That way lies lawyers. No wands, either. No wands, though. This isn't a children's book. It isn't? Then who the hell is it for? This is the real world. Oh, well, I'm glad that nobody that asked got all that cleared up. No wands, gotcha. So what do you have? An esprit. It's like a wand. It does exactly the same as a wand. You can even buy them in an esprit shop, but we don't get sued. After she witnesses Wade's men in black flashy thing, he tells her humans can't know who we are or what we do. It'll put them in danger for reasons that can't be explained in the parking lot of a casino. Reasons that don't exist. Gotcha. At least we got all the bland exposition out of the way early, though, didn't we? Didn't we? Oh well, just don't make it stupid. The secret coven is entered by a secret portal positioned in a kid's play park because nothing draws less unwanted attention than people with no children wandering through the play area. But it's inconspicuous because Forrest tells us it is. You had one job. On arrival at the coven, Wade encyclopedes some more. Call it an interdimensional pocket. We couldn't exactly build our coven where humans could see it or easily access it, so we devised these bubbles between dimensions. So, interdimensional bar pocket. Okay, so you said the same thing twice. Okay, but inter interdimensional bubbles. Clear as day. You're probably wondering how the, all this works. Space is not linear, nor is it finite. It can be bent to fit our needs, if we know how to do it. Most importantly, achieving such feats requires tremendous amounts of energy. Everything you see around you, in fact, is energy solidified into matter. Interdimensional bubbles. It's as clear as day. The coven is rigged to record and allow only certain individuals in, those that belong here, those that belong to other covens, and those we approve to come in. Interdimensional bubbles. It's as clear as f day. But I do have a stupid question. How does it work? Magic, Wade said. There are spells in place. See, this is supposed to be funny, contrasting his lengthy waffling with a non-answer, which means Forrest knows that her book is as exciting as watching paint dry and actually does nothing about it. Also, if you're going to make that contrast, for God's sake, do this. But Wade, isn't this some more bland exposition you can offer immediately anyway to just scupper that joke? For now, just think of this as a massive self-contained organism that has a conscience and a memory. It knows who we are, what we do, and when we do it. It remembers our steps with photographic precision, and it can be set to deny access to those lacking the appropriate clearance. Wow, Wade. That's almost exactly what you just said, only slightly rephrased. Magic is the result of powerful energy manifested through physical bodies. <laughs> Wade, you sure can make magic sound incredibly boring. And if you don't believe that Forrest likes to repeat herself, see pages 83 and 84 for Alton explaining the exact same thing in even more boring detail, if you can believe that. Luckily, amongst all this exposition, Forrest does a great job of describing their surroundings in a way that's fresh and exciting. She certainly doesn't describe something as dragon-like and something else as dragon-esque on adjoining pages. After all, that'd be repeating herself. In fact, Forrest seems to know exactly how interesting she's made everything, because Harley observes, the San Diego coven came across as a bit of a bureaucratic nightmare, with very little of the mystical charm I'd expected to find in a place like this. Well, there's certainly no Hogwarts, which is just as well or you'd get sued. But this passage is, in typical Forrest style, a point Harley has made just a little bit earlier, 
Wow, I can't believe I'm meeting real-life warlocks and witches and you all sound like bureaucratic pen pushers. But then Forrest is oddly keen on repeating herself. Wade is surprised and, and perturbed by an unscheduled visitor. He tells Harley it was unscheduled and he knows this because Orton clearly wasn't expecting it, as evidenced by the look on his face. Wade grumbled, prompting me to get a better look at Orton. He was right. Orton was stunned and not in a good way. That's some snappy dialogue there. Of course, we could just tighten this up a little bit, but if we do this every time Frost wants to tell us something twice, then our 369 pages is reduced to only 180. But Forrest isn't writing in the realist style. She doesn't need this book to be 370 pages of dead weight. It can be bright and breezy, like The Dresden Files, or, or what's that other book again? Harry Potter. Hey, Wade, how does mirror travel work? The coven is an interdimensional pocket, like a strip between blobs of space, but the strip is infinite, and you can sort of poke it in different places. Think of our world as a giant bag of blobs, bound or glued together with an interdimensional strip. The mirrors are like holes in different blobs. You step into one, and you pass through the strip, then make it out into another block. Like teleporting, except you don't get disintegrated reintegrated upon your arrival at your destination. Mirror travel only works with a particular spell, and if you know your destination, then any mirror will work. It's an old spell conjured up by ancient Egyptian warlocks. They were the first to discover the magical properties of reflective surfaces. Poor Harley is sent to the boring version of Hogwarts, but at least she's exempt from classes because the beastery is threatened, and if the beasts escape, then all the covens will be wiped out, and the beasts will then escape into the actual world, and there there'd be enough of them to wipe out the poor defenseless humans as well. Say, that's a big Twinkie. But with such a potential catastrophe on their doorstep, at least they get the best people on it. Or, nah, we could just give the investigation a handful of bickering schoolchildren. That makes sense somehow. Then the powers that be, the magical council that control all of the covens, finds out that the beasts are escaping, and it, that if they do, everybody could die. And then they dock the San Diego coven 50 house points. That'll show them not to literally get every single one of us killed, human and wizard alike. Once the investigation team of children has failed enough times that the other less talented group of children, including Harley, are assigned the most important case in all of the world. It's, it's at this point that Harley attends her first class. Really? That seems odd that she has no classes while she's busy doing busy work, but then is given lessons to interfere with the most vital investigation. Wait, can you explain this? To me, it seems like someone forgot there was classes, but then they stuck them in. But now it makes no sense because this case is really important. Everybody could die and nobody has done anything useful about that. Oh, what's the point? None of it makes a lick of sense anyway. Luckily, Harley takes the whole thing seriously. So we as readers know this is a pretty big deal because she turns up late for the one and only job that they actually have to do. It's at 10.15 at night. The classes run that late? Eh, just go with it. So they have her looking in a grimoire for a tracing spell, even though she doesn't know what a tracing spell is or what a grimoire is. This section, though, of seven children looking through boxes of files, that's as exciting as you'd expect. And Harley is actually helpful. She suggests they can narrow their search down if they focus on spells requiring anorin beads, a thing she only learned existed that very day. And the only thing she knows about anorin beads is that they disrupt spells. Not sure how they're going to help with an actual spell then. But they don't find them anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But luckily there's three pages of Santana now channeling her inner Wade to clear everything up. They're concentrated energy and they can mimic matter. They're also fully conscious. Okay, there's three more pages of that, but I'm, I'm done. If you want to see more terrible exposition, just pick a random page in the book and you'll find some and it will be awful. On one truly memorable passage, Forrest interrupts exposition with exposition. Oh, go on, one more for old time's sake. Wade, the world's most boring man. Tell us more about Esprit's. Think of it as a sports car. You can feel the rush from the moment you get in, but you still need to learn how to drive it properly so you don't end up in a lake. Just a short one that time, but maybe could have been a bit sure and still got that job done. On page 3 to 8, Harley wonders who and why anyone would want her dead. I know, it's me, and it's because your book is absolutely awful. In conclusion, Harley Merlin is so banal, so boring, and so worthless that one assumes that Forrest took its name from this and this rather than any associations with the Harlequinade or Geoffrey of Monmouth. 
Forrest utterly fails to capture the energy of Harry Potter because her book derives not from a place of inspiration but from a desire to smash out a cash in as quickly as possible. She dives feet first into the world, making the rules up as she goes along and vomiting them out in page after page of crushingly stilted dialogue and highly repetitive exposition, with Harley often serving as little more than a voice to ask why or how periodically before offering an awkward and unfunny quip to a legion of fawning admirers or her bored shitless narratee. I'm no expert on Harry Potter, but it was obvious from the off that that series was crafted with no less love than skill. Love for the characters and for the magic of both its world and the printed word. At most, Harley Mullen was printed with the love of banknotes. At worst, from the love of the undeserved vanity that comes from claiming to be a published author. This book is so sub-Harry, so sub Lyra, that it's hard to imagine that Anyone could feel much affection for the lifeless, repetitive and dull characters and situations on offer here. I could recommend it to people who've literally read every other single young adult book out there, but unlike Forrest, I actually respect them. This is awful, a void, and if you see a copy in the wild, kill it with fire. To release ten of these in a year with not a speck of quality present might also mean that Forrest is unlawfully imprisoning a thousand monkeys at a thousand typewriters. Some should probably look into that, but don't look into her books. So how, when you can't write for Toffee, do you become a million best-selling author? Well, the answer is actually revealed at the back of the book. Bella Forrest is author of the following books. However, this list is actually out of date. For example, it includes just two Harley Merlin books when Amazon tells me there is 10. So the answer is simple and beautiful because it requires nothing beyond the ability to hit keys on a keyboard with anything other than regularity. You write one million books and as long as you can persuade one sucker to buy each of them, then you're golden.